yo, welcome to your day off. My name's Corey, and of course, I'm sitting next to my buddy, Tony. What's up, bud? What's up, brother? How you doing, man? I'm, dude, this is it, man. Content month. Content month. So, uh, Tony and I have been talking for the last couple of months about how, by the way, we're, we're, we're recording this in March, so this is, uh, this is our content March. Um, I know it's April or May or whenever we release this, but we're recording it in March, and we're super stoked for content month. Um, everyone that we've... Uh, Everyone that we've brought in to record with on the month in the month of March um, is content based. You know, it's really cool. So today we've got a super special guest. We have uh, Miss Success underscore you, Ariella. Yeah, I'm not trying that last name. You try that last <laughs> name. You always get the last name. No, I'm not getting the last name, man. It's just too much. <laughs> um. Ariel is cool, man. She um she started a wedding business and she um she's also supporting the hairdressers by um sharing her her business insight um with I, I guess she's kind of like niched herself in the wedding um the wedding side of our, our our industry. I have like mad respect in the sense of if anybody can create a business on a basically a one time client, that's oh outstanding. Gosh. You know what I mean? How, Basically, it, you're hoping it's only a you know a one time client, right? Because you want that marriage to last forever, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're not unless, hoping for unless, a divorce, unless, right? Unless you're Ariella or you know someone who has a wedding business that you, you want a multiple times, but you know uh, to be able to to put a very successful business on a one time client, that's you know it's, it's amazing. I, mean, I can't mar- wait to dig into that. I can't either. I mean, your marketing has to be on point, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess without any further ado. Um, please welcome Miss Ariel. I'm not going to attempt her last name. I'm sure she'll let us know. Um, again, she can be found at Instagram, success underscore you. Miss Ariel, are you there? Welcome to your day off. Hello, you guys. Thank you guys so much for having me. How are you guys doing? Amazing. So how do you um, pronounce your last name? Oh, my gosh. Don't even get me started. All right. <laughs> so, well, if you don't know, we certainly don't know. All right. We'll so just we keep it as Ariel. So- as Europeans, we pronounce it Pochnevich because it is a Polish last name. But from what I understand, a lot of people pronounce it Pochnevich, but we we say Pochnevich. Gotcha. Uh, I don't think I'm attempting either one. Nope. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, before we get into uh, to the business uh, side of it, uh, where are you from? Yeah. Okay. So funny you guys ask. I did a lot of moving around. Uh, growing up just as a child. So I was born in Richmond, Virginia, and only lived there for a couple of months and then moved actually to Israel. So my biological dad lives in Israel. We lived there for two years Mm. Um, and then just kind of moved all over the tri-state area, moved back to the U.S. and eventually settled in like Northeast Philly, um, which is primarily where my childhood, you know, where I was raised and stuff. Does that make you an Eagles fan? It does, absolutely. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> That's awesome. Um <clears throat> what got you uh what got you into hair? When do you when did you kind of know? When when did you know that this was your path? So here's what's funny. I am definitely not that little girl that played with Barbies and said that I wanted to do hair since I was five years old. Uh-huh. That just was, was never really my thing. And it really wasn't until my senior year of high school when I it was kind of like push and shove. It was college is you know it was community college or it was a trade school um and it really wasn't until I got my parents approval where they were like you know you're really great at hair why don't you consider this this was already after I had taken my placement test at a local community college I got in I was ready to go under um psychology that was kind of like the thing that I was really interested in and (laughs) probably more useful as a hairdresser now than it would have been with your degree no freaking kidding. Yeah, that's <laughs> serious. Um, so kind of skipped the whole community college and went right to beauty school right out of high school. So I think it was a lot um, of like my parents' approval and feeling like I got that support from them, but it really wasn't on my radar at all. Oh, that's that's, that's very cool. cool, actually. I mean, a lot of times you hear the opposite story, like, you're not going to be a hairdresser, are you? Thank you, Grace. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, I mean, it wasn't on my radar. I always loved doing my own hair. I was always that girl that, you know, woke up really early to get my hair done for high school, but I was never doing, like, my friend's hair or, like, doing prom hair, anything like that, anything that you would think 
would be, you know, common for a hairdresser. So it was definitely not on my radar. I love doing hair. I loved hair. I love the creativity mm -hmm. of it, but it was never something that I seen as my future, believe it or not. So out of hair school, did you, uh, did you apprentice or did you go straight on the floor? Did you work for a salon? What yeah, was that so path? I, yeah. So while I was in hair school, I was working at a grocery store bagging up groceries because it was the only job that I could get my benefits covered because most salons don't obviously cover benefits. So right. I was in school full time, working at a grocery store part time and then doing part time at a high end salon local to my area where I was just shampooing, just kind of getting my feet into the industry, seeing what it was like. And I fell in love with the salon that I was working at. Oh, that's awesome. Was, yeah, it was very high end. I just loved the energy. It was like you walk in, there was just a, it was a social setting, the girls were great, um, and then eventually after I got done school, I went from shampooing to assisting, I had the ability to eventually quit my job at the grocery store, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I was there for a year, so it was yeah. long overdue, <laughs> um, and so I worked at the salon, and I was there for about four years between shampooing, assisting, and I like to call it attempting to build my book because it was definitely um, a hard time, you know, in the market to try to create a, a book, a solid book. Right. Like that. And so how, after four years, you eventually um, built that book? You know what? I did it. So, oh. yeah. Interestingly enough, I had a handful of clients that mm -hmm. I would call like my regulars. Right. Um, but in the salon that I was at, I just felt like I never was going to have the opportunity to be seen as a real stylist. I felt like everyone looked at me as at like that young 18 year old girl that sure. started. Um, so even like if I would, even if I had a client, I was still shampooing in between my clients. Because oh. Number one, I wasn't busy enough. Right. And number two, people just didn't know how to get away from, you know, asking a new shampoo girl or they were just so set in their ways and so used to it. Right. That I think it was, easy for them to come to me and I was very much a people pleaser at that time <laughs> so it was it was very easy for me to say yeah of course of course like anything you need um sure. which ultimately you know suffered my happiness at the end of the day so um I did end up leaving that salon um after about four years just because I didn't feel like I was going to grow as a stylist or as an individual there mm -hmm. I will give that salon full credit as far as everything I learned. Um, everything besides updos, which is really funny. So I learned my cutting skills. I learned my coloring skills. I apprenticed with the gentleman that was working there. who was fantastic. So basically everything I learned to this day, I give him credit for, except of course the updos. Except the updos. Yeah, it wasn't his thing. Um, he never really did it. But the salon I was working at was very big into weddings and special events and did bridal shows. And it was this big event for the day. People would bring food and champagne, at the, you know, into the salon. Right. Um, so it was definitely a big thing. So that's where I was. I felt inspired. I just loved that. I loved that personal connection you have with someone. I loved the idea of someone having photos you know, of their hair and makeup and knowing that I were to get full credit for it. So I loved everything about that <laughs> as opposed to, you know, your regular four to six week color and cut client. So I did it because I, I also didn't really know which direction I was going. It did take me a long time to find what I was super passionate about. So what, what, what changed at that point? I mean, how did you, um, you know, how did you transition from the salon to actually making a business out of wedding hair? Yeah, totally. So I remember, like it was yesterday, I did one of my last bridal shows with this particular salon. Um, I was at a point where I felt defeated. I was just unhappy. I was making chump change. I felt like I was working my butt off and it was just, I was just felt underpaid, underappreciated right. and kind of got to a point where I was like, well, why can't I do this on my own? I also, again, very type A, I love being in control, which could be a good or bad thing, but I will say that it, it was, it was tough to work for someone. I had, there were, I was kind of set in my ways where I'd like things done a certain way. And if it wasn't done, then I was just, like, I just wasn't super happy with, I guess, the way things were done by this particular boss. So I eventually mm -hmm. thought to myself, why can't I do this on my own? So I wasn't quite ready to make that leap. So I decided to still explore being behind the chair. So I moved salons. So I went probably about 
six, seven miles up the road. So I was still in the same general area. So I could take a little bit of clientele I had right. and didn't, you know, I didn't have a doubt in my mind that they wouldn't follow me just because the prices were similar. We were still so close, um, you know, to the old place. So I was at this salon for about seven months. And in between that time, I decided to do a bridal show on my own. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. A bridal show. What, what do you mean a bridal show? So like a bridal expo. So, uh-huh. Where so this is know, just you by yourself. Like you didn't you you didn't join another expo that was already going. This is just something Ariella said. You know what? I'm going to create this from scratch. So the expo is basically an expo full of different wedding vendors. Okay. So from florists, photographers, hairstylists, you know, invitation designers, and what it is is it's it's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of prospect brides that are basically walking this expo trying to find the remaining of their vendors for their wedding. Right, 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 right. Right, so there were, I had an opportunity kind of fall in my lap. I had made a couple connections in between this time when I was working at this new salon. So I got into the expo. Again, it just kind of fell in my lap, and I had the opportunity to even do hair for the fashion show. So at many expos, there's fashion shows where people are showing off dresses and hair and makeup. So I had the opportunity to do hair for the fashion show, which was extremely, like, just awesomeness, awesome sauce. It was just super Did cool. you feel any pressure? Like, I know a lot of people who, when they attempt to do, uh, you know, especially early in their in their career, they get terrified or they're, like, nervous uh, putting hair up. You're doing hair for someone's wedding that's going to be remembered forever. Any of that, uh, you know, slow you down at all? Or did, you didn't even worry about that? You just You were just, you know, full steam ahead. I was terrified. <laughs> I was absolutely terrified, um, especially because you hear all those scary bridezilla stories. You just don't really know who you're going to meet. Again, because they're not regular clients, I only meet them for such a short period of time before I actually get to see them again for their wedding. So a lot of the times I don't know what to expect. I don't know what's going to happen. It's kind of like, you know, you swing a bat and see what happens. Right. So by doing hair for the, uh, the show inside the uh, bridal expo, that you're like, put the spotlight on me hey look at me look at me here i am it was it was terrifying so sink or like, swim right basically yeah so i still had a table where i got to advertise like my books and i had business cards and i had you know rec cards and stuff so i had my husband who was my boyfriend at the time so funny he was at my table and he was like mingling with all these women like representing me giving out my cards while i was back to hair yeah, it was awesome. And I was like, I think I just need a guy at my table. I just feel like women are attracted to, you know. I think you should marry guy. that guy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was just so cool. So I was backstage doing hair. And the best part about it was at the very end of the fashion show, they got to, like, announce my name and say who did the hair and makeup and so forth and so on. Um, but the best part of the story is, so I was at the expo representing myself, mm-hmm. but so was the first salon I worked at, they were there too, representing their salon. It was a very interesting setting. Um, you know, I left on good terms, so it was mm-hmm. nice to see people again, but we were also kind of each other's competitors in a weird way because we're so local to each other. So did that, yeah. did that feel more like validation or was that more intimidating? Oh, it was empowering as heck. I oh, think yes. It was, it was the best feeling. It was just kind High of like reassuring. <laughs> yeah, it was very reassuring to me. That's amazing. Right. You know? Yeah. Do you, uh, awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, they're probably like, wow, you know, we did a good job. <laughs> you know what? They did do a good job, though. They, yeah. You know, she probably felt very proud. But at, you know, at the same time, it's a different setting. I was no longer working for her. So the dynamics were much, much different. That's awesome. Right, this, but, you know. Yeah. The but, sensei yeah. becomes the student. That's right. Birds have to fly, right? That's right. Can we get any yeah. other uh, puns in or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Ariella, so when you started your business, it was just you by yourself, or did you um, did you kind of like have a team? Yeah, so I started as a one woman show. I truthfully had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I was still working at the second salon while I was kind of trying to build up what I thought would just be a side gig. Um, so I was very honest with my boss and I basically told her why I wasn't going to be here on Saturdays. And of course that can be conflicting on the most you know busiest day of any salon. Um, so she seemed to be very understanding at first. 
uh-huh. uh, until I got to a point where I really wasn't there maybe two or three Saturdays out of the month. And it may not have been necessary. So, so Ariella, I, 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 I don't know if I missed it. So the salon was charging the weddings or was that just your side, uh, your side hustle? That was my side hustle. Okay, so, so the salon wasn't taking any of the proceeds from the weddings. That is correct. Um, which is also why I felt the need to be very honest and upfront with what I was doing and why I wasn't going to be there. Um, so I, I think that's still, underrated, by the way. Like I'm honest, on, I think that's underrated. You know, just being honest with your boss and like, you know, I think at the end of the day, especially when it comes to hairdressers, you know, we're 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 all working behind the chair and we all have dreams and ambitions. So I think it's really, I think it's really helpful and in, in the long run is just to be honest and upfront with your boss about you know th- these are my desires and this this is what I'm looking for because you know they had it you know nobody nobody went on the floor and then opened a salon you know everyone went to the floor with those same dreams and ambitions. So I just Absolutely. you know one of my big pet peeves in the industry and. I would love for us to be able to get, uh, get a, uh, you know, to give two weeks notice, but it never seems to work out that way. You know, it always seems like the moment that they find out that you're leaving or the moment that you decide to leave, you know, then it just becomes a big client grab and, you know, 10 years of relationships are over in a second. Yep, you're absolutely right. And I, for my first salon, I did give a two week notice because that was, you know, the right professional thing to do. Sure. And, and the day I gave my notice was the day that she asked me to leave. <laughs> right. And, so. and, and it comes down to being a client grab. You know, I mean, there's no feelings there. Everybody's in the same game. You know, you, you wanted to grab clients and they wanted to grab clients. But you, you just kind of wish it was it could, it could work out better in our industry. Yeah. You know? but, it is unfortunate that that happened. But I guess that's just the name of the game, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, again, to reemphasize, that is the name of the game. But it, it's an unfortunate um, truth about our profession. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. So anyways, I'm sorry. I apologize. So you, um, so when you were doing, you just starting up a one woman show, were you, uh, were you charging like hourly? Were you charging per person? I mean, how, how did, yeah. So when I first started, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I kind of just decided to get my name out there and the bridal expo was very helpful in terms of getting some exposure and publicity. Mm -hmm. Um, that show consisted of probably, I want to say it was around 1200 brides. And at the very end of the expo, you basically get a list of all the brides. You get their information, their phone number, their email addresses. So I spent weeks individually emailing all these brides and basically telling them about myself, what I offer and what my services are. Some I heard back from, some I didn't, um, but it was just something that I had to do starting out. I didn't really know how to get my name out there or what to do, right. especially because I was so fresh in the industry. At that point, I was only a licensed cosmetologist for, what, like two and a half years? Wow. Um, so it was definitely a lot of figuring out. Um, so I started off by myself. Um, was really just connecting with people, making connections in the industry, reaching out to other professionals, asking, you know, where are they advertising, just kind of picking people's brain Mm -hmm. just to get an idea of what I'm getting myself into. Um, And I knew that still being behind the chair, I almost had an out. So it was kind of like my safe zone. If that, you know, if this side gig never worked out, I still had a chair to come back to. So that's something that I always came back to. And I never really envisioned having my own bridal business as a full-time thing because it seemed almost so far-fetched sure. to have it be a full-time job. So you're full-time wedding now, right? I'm full-time wedding, yep, 100%. So how does that work? Like, does it just take, like, great budgeting as far as getting through, you know, like the winter months, are, there's not a lot of weddings. You know, you're not doing four a month, certainly. I would assume. Maybe you are. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you're flying around the country. Yeah, that's a great question. So we definitely do have like an off season, although every year seems to extend wedding season. I used to feel like wedding season was between, let's say, like April to October, Uh maybe like end of September to October. Now I feel like it's stretching. There's a ton of November weddings and there's a handful of December weddings. That's me. (laughs) Yeah. I think people really love the winter months. I think it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then you get into like the holidays and people like the Christmas weddings and the New Year's Eve is absolutely huge. Um, And then there is a slow period, you know, right after the new year until like February and March. So I know there is an off season, but it's really not as long as I feel like people might think it is because I just, people are just getting married at any time of year and people are loving the off season because they also get fixed pricing. But honestly, I mean, honestly, those are the same months in the salon that we start to slow down a little bit too. So, you know, I don't even know if it's that much different, you know? You know what? Yeah. You know, that's a great point. It's really not a whole lot different. It really gives me... A t- you know, time to 
get all my thoughts together and see what I want to do new in the business. It gives me time to catch up on things that I felt like I was slacking on during the busy times. Um, and it also gives me time to meet new brides and perform their trials. So although I'm not physically going out to do the weddings, I am still meeting with brides and taking care of their trials and emailing and phone calls and contracts. So right. the, the off season is my busy season for paperwork and office work and things of that such. So, so back to the, the, to the original question, I mean, when you were flying solo, I mean, was it hourly or did you charge per person or how did that, you know, how'd you figure it how does it, yeah, how did you figure it out? Yeah, so I was per person. Um, it wasn't an hourly, it was basically per head. And a lot of the, a lot of the prices came from just working in a salon. So I reflected back on what the old salons were charging that I was working at. Right. At, and kind of doing like an average and an in-between and something that made sense. They were probably similar to salon prices, but I was also offering on location. I gave like a complimentary on location, you know, to a certain radius, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of miles from where I was located. So it was, it was per person. Um, bride pricing, diff, you know, was a little bit different than bridesmaids and junior bridesmaids and then, of course, the flower girls. So there were different prices, um, but it was all per head. Right. What struggles did you run into or any kind of obstacles or, or as we like to say, learned opportunities um, when you first started? Like, what, what were the big ones? What were, what were the ones that, that if you could give someone advice that was doing it now, you know, what would you avoid or what would you do? Yeah. So I think the biggest obstacle I had was being so fresh in the industry and just not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> Naivety. <laughs> I have any your your, uh, your your learning experience. Yeah, it's really or lack of, let's just say. Um, I just didn't really have much experience. I really didn't know what I was doing. I think that the only thing that kept me going was when I ended my job at the second salon um, on her terms. She decided to actually get rid of me because she felt like my passion for other things was conflicting. So that was mm -hmm. kind of fuel to my fire. Um, it was definitely a, there, a there's that type A again, right? Oh, yeah. Seriously. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so it was definitely, that was a rough time just figuring out what I was going to do, if I was going to go back into a salon, or was I going to just pursue this side gig that may or may not, you know, be something successful. Um, so luckily I was in a position where I had the opportunity to solely focus on just weddings. And getting my name out there was the hardest thing because nobody knew who I was. They didn't know what I was doing. They didn't even know what I could do. So I can call myself a bridal hairstylist, but I didn't really have much to show for because at that point, I didn't have a lot of weddings. I didn't have a big portfolio of photos. There just really wasn't anything to show for. So my biggest advice for anyone starting out is just start connecting and collaborating and even doing like styled photo shoots where you're not getting paid for it, but you're connecting and you're being able to add to your portfolio. So is that is that how you got your name out there? I mean, is that um, these are the I, techniques I, that you use to get your name out? Yeah. So I really just connected with local wedding vendors, just local to my area, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of social media. Social media was a big thing for me, um, and I started about six years ago. So. Social media, business-wise, is wasn't as big as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, so that wasn't as easy to do. But I started a Facebook group, you know, a business Facebook page, and social media was a big one. And then you just kind of you talk to people, and the more you talk to people and find they find out what you do, chances are they know someone that's getting married or that is engaged or is about to get married. Um, right. So really, just talking about it collaborating with people and trying to get as much exposure as possible. Um, in the beginning, I really didn't have the funds to put out for marketing. So I didn't really do much marketing besides, you know, free things like social media and really doing like the old school thing where I go to different wedding vendor or, you know, wedding venues and I hand out my cards and I talk a little bit about myself. So it was very much me selling myself a hundred percent without much marketing. It's amazing how, uh, you know, I mean, not only in, in this, uh, dynamic, but throughout all of uh, the hair industry, uh, uh, you know, media, social media is playing a huge, and, and obviously you were in the forefront, you know, you said in the beginning, but everybody goes back to to uh, social media, how it, it kind of connects us all. I mean, I don't think we've had a podcast yet where social media hasn't come up, right? Yeah, yeah social media Just a is game changer. huge for businesses. Oh my, complete game changer, 100%. We were um, 
we had a we had a conversation uh, with Kiala Maravici about how, like, uh, <laughs> we'll talk to Justin, right? But how even um, whether you're a hairdresser in New York, whether you're a hairdresser in L.A., you know, those used to be the markets where you got a lot of attention. But now if you're, you know, if you're Justin from Boise, Idaho, you know, you, you have the same opportunities for attention in this industry. You know, it's not like you're not playing any longer to the big companies. You know, you're actually playing to your own skill and your own skill set. That's a great point because you think about like all the smaller scale towns that don't really, you know, it, it's really been a game changer as far as getting your name out there. Sure. But you're also able to connect with other people. And there's just so many like just social media influencers that are just like famous now or like mm-hmm. famous Instagram. Like it's incredible what it has done for people and businesses and small businesses too. Well, we're going to get into the, to, to the meat of some of this because, okay, you know, you have a bridal business, you were successful, but you don't see this part of it anywhere as becoming a bridal, having a bridal coaching business, you yeah, know, no doubt. where you're teaching other people how to be successful having a bridal business. That's impressive. Yeah, absolutely. How do Thank you. you. How, so, yeah, how did that come about? Yeah, I mean, how, what's the evolution? Or what's the evolution into that? Yeah. Yeah, so I've always... Like, so I built this business. I was a one woman show. I eventually got to a point where I couldn't handle large bridal parties. So I ended up taking on a couple stylists and I, I grew that way. And were these, were these, were these, um, I'm sorry, were these, uh, were they friends of yours or did you just kind of see their work or did you find them through social media? Did you, you know, did you join another, you know, wedding kind of group? I mean, how did, how'd you find them? How'd you, how were they, how'd you know that they were going to represent your brand? Right. How did they meet your standard? Right. So interestingly enough, in the beginning, I didn't know what my brand was. I didn't know what my standard (laughs) was. And I was also at a point where I felt like I was making almost rash decisions because I kind of had to. I felt like I was pressured because I was getting these bookings, but I didn't have enough people. So I made a ton of mistakes. I made a lot. You know, I hired a lot of people that I today would not hire. I'll put it that way because I just didn't really know what I was looking for. Um, but the first person that I did hire, believe it or not, I found her through Craigslist. I just like randomly put an ad and I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to get any traction on this, but let me just see if it sticks. Um, and she was phenomenal. She was with me for years and she ended up going to a different direction of hairdressing, mm-hmm. which is why she's no longer with me, but she is amazing. I like love her to this day. So um, I hired her through Craigslist and then some people I knew, some people I just knew from the industry, some people I just collaborated with, and then some people I had no idea who they were and they were just friends of friends who were referred to me. I put stuff out on social media because again, social media is huge for all of this. Um, and then just kind of built from hair, you know, just doing hair. I had assistants, I had stylists, and then I got to a point where I felt like my business was kind of plateauing because we weren't offering makeup services as well. So I found that people wanted kind of like a one, you know, one stop shop, one company that did it all, one contract, one communicator. So that's when about two years ago, I decided to bring on a makeup team as well. So now we offer hair and makeup um, and it just makes it so convenient for everyone that's involved. So how many are in your team now? There's a total of seven. So do you pull all seven or is that just for like big weddings or, you know, do, is, if, if I do, if I book a book, if I book a wedding with you, say it three times, I know, right. <laughs> you're bringing the whole team. No. So it really depends on how many we're going out for. So if we, for example, have three smaller weddings, I'll book all three of them because I have enough, you know, ladies to go and send out to each event. If we're booking a larger wedding, I'll have perhaps two stylists and two makeup artists, and then I have additional ones to send out for smaller mm-hmm. parties. So it really just depends Bravo. on what's going on that day. Bravo, good job. So how did this um how did this evolve into the business coaching? Yeah, so I felt like I learned from a ton of mistakes. I felt like I had even just close colleagues of mine come to me and ask me business related things or scenarios or like, oh, I'm dealing with this one bride and she's emailing me and I just don't know what to tell her. Um, So I just felt like I was able to give advice. I felt like my advice was, you know, logical, but yet Mm -hmm. made sense from a business standpoint. And I just super fell in love with the business side of things. I loved the administrating work. I loved, you know, being behind the computer and communicating with brides and, setting policies and procedures and boundaries. Like I just got so inspired to be a really, you know, strong, solid professional business 
that it turned into a passion. Um, and then I, you know, I had a couple of girlfriends that were just doing online businesses and it was like a whole other world for me. Like I didn't even realize that there's online coaches. That was like, no whole, way. I had no idea about it. Um, and I was like, you know what, this is awesome. So if I eventually, you know, want to take the back seat and doing hair and just run a business and be able to teach people all the things that I did wrong or teach people all the things that took me years to get to, right. that's what I want to do. So I also felt like when I started my business, I didn't know who to turn to. Everything was trial and error. Like I said, I didn't know what I was doing. It wasn't until I basically tried things out, trial and error, made a ton of errors, fixed my mistakes. Some of the mistakes ended up, you know, affecting me in the long run and I was able to fix them. Mm -hmm. But if I could help other professionals, creative professionals in this industry, avoid the mistakes I made and that's what I want to do. That's uh, that's that's one of our uh, mantras here is community driven. We love people who uh, want to give back to our industry, and it's, that's exactly what you're doing. You're you figured out all your mistakes and learned from it. Now you're going to show other people how to avoid those mistakes. But when you're when you're coaching, do you do you coach uh, just the uh, business side of it? Yeah, definitely. So it is strictly business. So there's no like hands on tutorial, nothing of that sort. Um, It's basically, it's very personalized for each client. So it really depends on who's struggling with what, what their obstacles are, what their challenges are. I actually find that a lot of business struggles ultimately comes down to like a confidence. So I find myself talking a lot about confidence. Hey, can you say that again? Because that is right on. I mean, what what's the saying? She hit yeah. the nail on the head, or she yeah. hit the head of the nail, or yeah, something. I mean, point. you see so many young hairdressers mm-hmm. that are so gifted and talented, but they don't have the confidence, and nope. it holds them back. Absolutely. Oh, I mean, okay. I, I literally have one in my head that I'm thinking of now. You know, which I, I just kind of want to shake her and be like, "Dude, you're so great. You just need to know that you're so great." Yeah, and I find that so frequently with people that are so talented and they have so much massive potential. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of them understanding what they could do with all that potential and being confident and confident reflects so much and tremendously into your business. It just bleeds into it and it affects other things that you're doing. It affects your clients. It affects how you're running a team, how you're running a business. Absolutely. Confidence, I feel like stems from a lot of things. Confidence is something that I did not have right off the gate. (laughs) Also, that's something that I personally had to work on myself, um, which is a lot of mindset work and practicing Mm -hmm. and, Basically, just knowing that I was capable of the things that I was doing. You know, I mean, I'll give you my experience with confidence is that if you sit back and wait for it, it's never going to come. Yeah. You know, you, you yeah. have to be proactive and you have to um, you have to take a step forward um, into whatever your dreams are. You know, I mean, you know, where we were when we first started the podcast, you know, Tony, I'll tell you, we literally spent like two and a half hours talking and we got about one minute of content and then, um, but you know, we're so much further down the road now only because we've done it. That's it. You know, only because we didn't let that one minute, you know, stop us and, and move forward. Um, not to be too cheesy or make it about us necessarily, but you know, I think at the end of the day, if you, it'll never come if you don't push for it, you know, you have to have to do something to, um, to build that confidence. It never just shows and, up. And there's a difference between confidence and you see a lot of people who don't have the confidence, but they, they try to project it in a arrogant or cocky way that shows you that you don't have what it takes to back that up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that is a natural, I guess, emotion or feeling that people can have when it comes to when you don't know how to do it, you just kind of act like you do. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes a lot from fear based because people fear that, you know, they'll see that you're phony or they're going to, you know, see right through you. I just feel like that's a natural thing for people to feel. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is a difference between, com- you know, being confident and cocky. You know, you still you want to be confident, but you still want to be humble at the same time. So Absolutely. Yeah. The confidence, how others see you. Does that make sense? Sure. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, I understand. So, you know, we, um, I think, I think, you know, that, that, you know, feeling like a fraud, I think that's the better word, right? I feel like a fraud. Like this whole podcast is a fraud, Ariella. <laughs> it's all a fraud, you know. <laughs> but that, you know, that's the process. You know, when you get you, when you get on the other side of feeling like a fraud, you know, then then you're like, oh, wait a second, maybe m- maybe we can do this. Right. Yeah. But you know what? That adds fuel to your fire, does it not? Uh, absolutely. Because well, once again, because I've identified it as the process. Like I know that this is the way that we have to do it. Well, I love that you said that you guys understand the process and you've accepted it. 
because that's exactly what business is. It's a process. It's sure. not something that's going to happen overnight. Or just even being behind a chair, all of it's a process. And growing and thriving is a process, just like everything else. So it's not something that just, you know, you don't wake up one day and become this awesome, successful no. person that, you know, knows how to cut hair like a badass or anything of that sort. Absolutely. And, you know, that uh, definitely goes back to the, um, the point of you have to do it in order to learn it. You know, you, you, yeah. you never not feel that way. You know, you never, you never fake it till you make it. And if you don't accept that, the process, that that's part of the process. Yes. I love, love, love. You just said that a hundred percent. So, I mean, I think speaking for Tony and I, or I will speak for Tony and I, you know, I think the difference between, you know, being young and, and being, shall we call it advanced is understanding that process, you know, understanding that everything in life happens because of a process. Yeah. hundred percent. Everything is always a process and anything that you do at that. Absolutely. So as you built this, um, this bridal business, this coaching business, uh, was it when you were building your team, how did you go about managing that team? Or, I mean, was that a process itself? Yeah. So building a team was a heck of a process and it still is a process because I just feel like I'm never really done hiring because I am also so niche in my industry that I can't offer these girls a full-time position. So they give right. me their weekends. They give me, you know, a couple of days during the week when they're doing their trials. But for the most part, they have their own full-time jobs, whether they're freelancers, whether they're working in a salon that, you know, and they just have the flexibility. Mm-hmm. So I'm still in a position where I'm constantly learning, you know, just even in my own bridal business, there's still things that happen but I feel like that's what makes me a good coach is that I'm able to discuss the things that have happened, what I did to get past it, and how to do it so nobody else can make that same mistake or anything similar. Um, but as far as the, the coaching business, this is something I'm doing on my own. So I don't have any team members as of now right. um, that I delegate to do anything. So it is a one-woman show while I'm still running the hair and makeup you know, bridal business. So I, have a, I mean, I have a couple of questions about that. How do you charge for your, your coaching business? Yeah, so I'm doing a couple of different things, and I still have a couple other things still in the works. So I offer a four- and a six-week program. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really just depends on what the struggles and challenges are and how much time both myself and this client feels like they need with me based on mm-hmm. you know what they, they're trying to overcome. So prior to even hopping on any type of program, I offer a 30-minute call to success. What that is, is basically a phone call where I get to hop on the phone with this client. Right. We can kind of talk about their issues, their goals, their desires, how they can get there on a logistic level, of course, and basically discussing if we would be a good fit for one another. There's some people that I might feel are not coachable or not teachable or anything of that sort. And some people just might have these challenges that I personally don't think I can help them overcome. Right. So that 30-minute so, phone call is like a consultation, like you consult and kind of figure out yeah, how to give exactly. them what they need? Yeah, so they get a 30-minute call. Prior to the 30-minute call, they have a questionnaire they fill out uh, based on their business, what they're currently doing, what they're striving for. Mm-hmm. So that way when we hop on the phone call, we're not spending 30 minutes getting to know each other. At that point, I already have a pretty good idea of what their problems are or their right. struggles or their issues. The challenges. Right, exactly. And then that way, for the 30 minutes, we could just dive right in and really see if we would be a good fit for one another. And I could advise them if they need, you know, a four week program or a six week program Mm -hmm. or anything past that. Um, I just recently added something that I haven't even publicly posted about, but because you guys have me on this podcast, I'll let you guys in on it. (laughs) Right, right. I find I find that a lot of people are reaching out for like scenarios or things that they're currently going through where they're kind of like, Hey, I want to pick your brain. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do this program called your pick your brain call where they basically have one phone call with me for an hour, um, where I basically know what their struggles are. They Mm -hmm. get to basically pick my brain. They can ask me anything they want on a specific topic that they're struggling about. And then I basically give them direction, how they, how to move forward. If I feel kind of like a life coach, huh? Yeah, kind of. If I feel like their struggles, you know, have, you know, if they need like a cheat sheet or template or some type of worksheet, um, then that's included as well as like a follow up email in regards to everything we just discussed. Mm -hmm. So the pick the pick your brain call is on the works. Um, I love it because I feel like oftentimes people aren't ready to dive into a four or six week commitment whether it is financially or time-wise, if they just don't right. have that in their calendar. Um, so that's why I offer a one-hour pick-your-brain call just for people that are going through something specifically that they almost need answers immediately. Right. 
That's amazing, actually. Um, like, once again, bravo to you for um, just being available to our industry. Thank um, you. Thank you. Let, let's dive right in. So I, I reached out to you because you wrote a post on your Instagram about ba- how to create and maintain boundaries with your clients on, on social media. Um, I'd love to dive into that a little bit. And then I want to get back to, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of, of how one should um, run their wedding business. Yeah, totally. So one of, again, the most common struggle that I find, even with myself, it's something that I struggled with for a while, too, is being able to set boundaries. I think that as entrepreneurs, it's hard to even get a grasp of how much time needs to be invested into a business. It's not a clock in, clock out job. So it's not like you get to come home and not have any other worries or priorities. So I think that setting boundaries with yourself Mm -hmm. and your clients is so incredibly important. Just basically setting yourself office hours where you say, you know, during this time is when I'm going to respond to emails. Uh This is the time I basically shut off social media and or emails. So is this something something that you would share with your clients? Um, Say, listen, if you text me at nine o'clock at night, you're not going to hear from me till the morning. Or is this just something that you just do and they don't hear from you till nine o'clock? Are your clients aware that these are your hours? No, so I have not posted hours because there are, of course, days where I feel like clients absolutely need an answer. Uh So it might not necessarily be that I'm not checking my emails because sometimes I do feel like, you know, sometimes people need something right away. So I'm guilty of going outside of my quote unquote, I mean, I'm making air quotes hours Sure. because there is no such thing as, you know, real hours, but you have to create boundaries because if you're getting back to emails and your clients within minutes then they're going to expect that every single time that they're sending you an email. So being able to create boundaries. That's a great point, by the way, because I'm definitely guilty of that. You know, Tony and I, we both work in a studio salon. So, you know, we get emails and stuff, just even about appointments. And, um, you know, sometimes it does take a second. And then I I didn't think about what the long term of that was. So I just took something from that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And it's, listen, I was guilty of it myself. I was getting back to emails, like, quickly where people were like, oh my God, thank you so much for getting back to me so quickly. And then I started seeing a pattern where they were kind of expecting it every time they reached out to me. And even when I didn't feel like it was super urgent and I felt like it could have waited for the next day or so, they were almost like continuously emailing me like, hey, did you get my email? But I think it was because I had not set boundaries. So within my boundaries is I'm getting back to a client within 24 to 48 hours. Something that I think is reasonable, realistic, and gives me time to kind of get to it based on priorities. I will say the majority of my my time frame doesn't really go past the 24 hours because I basically give myself office hours every day. Mm -hmm. Um, There are, you know, days off that I call, but for the most part, I'm in the office X amount of hours per day. It's just if I let emails go or if I let clients go, it just piles up, and that's where I know I get overwhelmed, and so I try to avoid things like that. Great advice. Yeah, that is fantastic advice. Does that same advice, you know, not just emails, but you know, let's say like someone reaches out to you on Instagram or somebody reaches out to you on Facebook, which is you know kind of the way that how long did it take her to get back to you? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Good good point. So, um, I mean, how do you create those boundaries, you know, where your face is on everything? Yeah, you know, it's tough. It's definitely challenging. Something that I recently discovered that I didn't even know, you know, they even had. So Facebook Messenger, um, and I'm talking about it more from like a business Facebook page, allows you to put an away message. So as soon as someone reaches out to you, you, you know, it automatically sends them an away message. Whether it says, hey, I'll get back to you in 24 to 48 hours, or hey, head on over to my website so you can fill out the contact form. I know for myself, if if it's not an email in my inbox, all my social media messages, they end up getting buried. Like I'll yeah. check it and then they just get buried and then I forget about it. So do it, putting in a way message, basically directing your client what's to come, I think is a great idea and a great way to be able to set boundaries without coming across, you know, too aggressive. But so my away message, for example, says, you know, congratulations on your upcoming event. Please head on over to our website and fill out our contact form so we can send you a proper quote. And that way we have a little bit more detail based on your event. And then that way, you know, at their time, they can head on over to the website, fill out the contact form, tell me a little bit about themselves, their wedding, what it entails. And then within my 24 to 48 hour policy, I can get back to them. I know it's in my inbox. I know, you know, that's a responsibility and a priority that I have to get back to. You know, diving forward into your wedding business, what what is that contact form like? What questions are you asking on that content form? And you know, what if if I was starting a wedding business, like what would that initial um, contact look like? 
Definitely. So you obviously want to know their name, you know, their address, general information of that sort. It's also important to know how many guests are interested in hair services and or makeup services, what time they need to be done, you know, as far as having their beauty look completed, uh -huh. um, a little bit about their event. So where the location is, who their photographer is, that's always important. Um, and one thing that I think is awesome that I feel like a lot of people end up overlooking is asking the question of where they found you. Ooh, so that's, a good one. I mean, that's super important because if you're investing your time and or funds in mm -hmm. some type of advertising or marketing, whether or not they're booking you or not to know where they find you is everything. It's everything Absolutely. for your marketing and it's, it brings the traction for everything that's needed. So that is like a must have that I feel like a lot of people overlook. You want to know where people find you. I know I want to know where people find me. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Every Absolutely. time I get a new client, I, that's what. Thing I one of the things I ask is how yeah. did you hear about How'd you us? heard about us exactly? Yeah. You mentioned photographers. Is there? Do you work with you know certain photographers or certain venues? You know what I do. I've been able to build so many relationships with so many fantastic photographers that mm -hmm. I would never you know just offer one. There's just so many people that I've met and so many connections I've made that I would absolutely offer them a list of potential photographers that I think might be a good and venues as well. So like you've created this like whole like wedding network. Yeah, venues, yeah, we're associated with a couple of venues in our local area. We're associated with a couple, you know, like popular hotels down in the city, um, as well as like some estates in like the Bucks County area. So we've definitely been able to develop relationships with these people and owners. Um, so that's been really, really fantastic. So again, for people that are starting out, connections are everything. It's oftentimes not about what you know, but who you know. So when you when when you're coaching, do you coach uh, the people you're coaching? Do you teach them teach them how to do that? Yeah, so we go through, again, depending if that's what they're struggling with, if they're like, you know, new to the industry, don't know how to get their name out there. That's definitely one of the topics that we cover is knowing how to get your name out there. Even if you are on a budget, even if you don't have the funds, if timing is on your side, mm -hmm. there's so much that you can do to that. Awesome. So when you, um, so I'm, I'm the bride, I, I've reached out to you on your social media, and um, I've filled out my contact form. Like, do you go into like, a, is the next conversation... Or once you commit to it, are there, are there contracts or, or, or how do you uh, how do you handle that part of the business? Yeah, definitely. So initially I send them a quote so they get to know a little bit about the business, what they can expect, the prices. Mm -hmm. I go into a little bit about trials. OK, let's slow um, down there a little bit, because I know um, I know in the industry when it when it comes to pricing and stuff, that's like the most uncomfortable conversation. Do you have any techniques or anything that you use or or, you know, some kind of mantra that you use in your head to be like, you know, I'm worth this? Yeah, so, oh, to, like, mindset type of work? Well, I mean, a lot of people in our industry um, struggle, especially young hairdressers. Um, they struggle with, with having that, the money conversation with their clients. You know, especially if you work in a, in a commission-based salon, you usually let the front desk, like, deal with that, right? Like, that's, been, right. that's an issue with a lot of salons. So, you know, uh, back to the question is, um, how do you work through that? Do you have techniques that you work through, or do you have a mantra that, um, to make that conversation a little easier? Yeah, so for me personally, I think it comes down to confidence and knowing what my time is worth. Right. Um, and not just my time, but my skill set too. So you're right. I think that having the money conversation can always be a little bit uncomfortable. Right. So I think it all stems back from just being confident. I think that is the stem to everything, uh, whether or not you know it's your skill set or the value that you're offering, mm -hmm. that's something that I think is everything. I will say that where I'm at now, as opposed to where I was six years ago, is like a complete 180. Like I said, I was 100% a people pleaser. I was that person that was totally cool with giving discounts because I wanted to book a job. Right. Now, I'm... I don't want to say, you know, I'm super strict because I'm still very understanding and compassionate to other people's situations. But you have but, a value now, right? What's that? Like you have an identified value now. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. So it's not there. If someone comes up to me and they just, you know, are asking for discounts or asking for things that I'm not super comfortable with in my mind, I just don't think that we're a good fit. And I'm okay with that mm -hmm. because I'm able to make space. For somebody else that values myself, my business, and my pricing. That's great. So it's sort of like when you're, when you know, you get out of hair school and you can go on the floor and try to learn everything yourself and it's, it's going to be hard. Or you can apprentice for somebody or learn from somebody who's been there, done it, 
and makes it a lot easier for you. And that's exactly what you're doing here. I mean, you've done all the the hard work. So when people reach out to you for this coaching, uh, you know, they can avoid all the the headaches, yeah, all the headaches and trying to, you know, learn it themselves and just bring you on and and that you show them, you know, what they're worth, how, how to charge, how to do these things, uh, and how to avoid these pitfalls. Well, I I would argue that if you hire Ariella, that, you know, that, that gives you perceived value. Right, like, 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 like you and know your business is going to be run correctly. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, it's funny you say that because I always tell people the best way to know when it's time to raise your pricing is a couple things. One, when you're getting too many yeses. So if you're getting too many bookings, if, all, if every single one of your inquiries are converting into bookings, uh-huh. it's because you kind of set yourself at a very you know, safe pricing where you're kind of always getting all these yeses, it's time to get no's. So you have to up your prices if you want to basically average out to like a a certain clientele, like a certain target audience. And also when you're investing in yourself and your business, that's when it's time to raise your prices just because you're already, you know, you're giving yourself value, whether it's hands-on, whether you're going to an updo class or a makeup class. But even if you're doing something like hiring a lawyer to look over your contract, you're investing in your business. So that's always an opportunity for you to up your prices. You are absolutely blowing my mind right now. <laughs> Thank you. This this is incredible information. <laughs> to get to, to backtrack again a little bit, just to try to stay on track, although we're doing a terrible job today. <laughs> There's just so much information. I don't know how, much, how to, to get it out there. I know. So back to your contracts, like, and thank you for being so generous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, back to your contracts, like, what's in your contract? What does your contract stipulate? And I mean the nasty stuff. I don't mean like I don't mean like make your client happy. I mean like you know what what's the thing that 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 runs your business through your contract? You know, like yeah. like your unnegotiables. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Non negotiables. Late policies yeah. or cancellation policies. Or- yeah, all that stuff. Totally. So like I said, I've gotten pretty comfortable with my, my business and being able to set these boundaries that probably seem really scary for one to add into their contract, but they're so incredibly necessary. So my contract consists of four pages along with four other documents, other documents that are, I guess, in conjunction to the contract. So mm-hmm. something that a client is reading and signing off on, whether or not they actually take the time to read it, it's not really on me. As long as they sign it, right. I'm under the impression that they read it. Sure. I mean, that, um, that, that's their responsibility, not yours. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, if anything were to happen, I could always reference back to their signature. You know, you read it, you signed off on it. So contracts are everything in this industry, everything. You cannot run a business without a contract. Um, so a few of my non-negotiables is a late policy. If you are late, you're getting charged for it. <laughs> so I basically have like time frames. If you're 15 minutes late, you owe X amount of money. If you're beyond that 15 minutes, every 10 minutes past that is an additional fee. Okay, hold so on. If- so so you, you, you book, what's your, uh, as far as time goes, you know, 15 minutes, but, but what's the time of the appointment? So let's let's put real value on it. I mean, if, if it's an hour appointment, you're 15 minutes late. That's 25 percent of of your allotted time. Is that kind of how you break it down, or 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 am I forecasting? No, you're forecasting. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Um, so I'll put it this way: when we're going out to an event, we have an X amount of you know time. Mm-hmm. So if we're going out, for example, to to take care of you know, let's just say 10 girls for a bridal party. We're going to allot five to six hours for that. Okay. With that time frame, if they're late beyond fifteen minutes, there's a fee for that. There's a fee for that because so that's on top. So that's on top of you know whatever your quoted amount was. Exactly. So this is additional fees if we have to get into that because listen, there's been many times when I'm knocking on a hotel door and nobody is there because everybody's downstairs for breakfast. Right. Well, then that just means you didn't value my business or my time. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, that just kind of annoys me that I feel like I wasn't taken seriously. Right. So to avoid those things, I put these in place because it's just something that I found was happening and I just felt like I wasn't being taken seriously. And it was hard for people to take me seriously. I was 22 when I started my business. So sure. all of my brides were older than me anyway. <laughs> so like, who is this young girl like that's about to do my wedding hair? I'm just going right. to go downstairs and eat breakfast and take my sweet old time. So, Ken, am I allowed to ask what that 15-minute window is going to cost me? Yeah, so anywhere from $50 to $100. 
So it really just depends on how late they are. So it, it starts at like a fifty a fifty dollar time frame. Mm-hmm. So if if you're booked at ten o'clock and you show up at ten fifteen, then you uh you just you just charge me fifty bucks. Correct. Mm, that's yeah. that's that's unbelievable. Because you know what it is is once people put money to it, like once you talk about money, that's when people are like gonna respect you a little bit more. And I hate to sound that way, but it's I don't think it's respect though. But I, I think it has to do more with like perceived value, right? Like 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 one of my anecdotes is um, I actually uh, do a lot of um, coaching, not like hairdressing coaching, but actually sports coaching, and yeah. I honestly would do it for free. But the problem is if I do it for free, then nobody shows up. That's exactly because people won't take you seriously. They won't value. They won't value that time that you booked out for your afternoon unless, you know, you charge them. hundred, hundred percent. Um, or even when people are coming late with like a cup of coffee, that really turns my wheel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're already late. They're probably late because they were grabbing a cup of coffee, which is fine. But, you know, if they know they're getting charged for it, maybe they'll skip that cup of coffee. That's a $50 right. cup of coffee. <laughs> that coffee must be good. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's your late policy. And then um, what are your other non-negotiables? Yeah, so there's late policies. What else do we have here? How about cancellation? Or I guess hopefully uh, there's no cancellation on the day of. But like if oh you're God. doing a uh, you know a, a prior pre-run or yeah, there is definitely a cancellation policy. So they have up to 45 days prior to their wedding to basically make any changes and or cancellations. If they cancel, they are going to owe. Uh, I believe I have it set at. Uh, half fifty uh, percent of the actual event. Um, That's inside of forty five days. Correct. Or yeah. no, I'm sorry. Within forty five days, they are going to owe in full. Oh, okay. So that's a hundred percent. So a hundred percent. Yeah, and they do that. So if my groom leaves me, I'm also uh, on the hook for a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And so I do that. What a jerk. <laughs> Within the 45 days, it's very unlikely that we would get any other bookings, and we're just out an entire day. No, that it totally makes sense from a business perspective. Yeah, I mean, luckily we didn't ever have to really go down that route, believe mm-hmm. it or not. So that's but it's been there. really great. Um, but also, I keep them bounded to this contract. So if they are ch- making any changes within, you know, the last 45 days of their event, they mm-hmm. would technically still out. So, for example, if they have 10 girls that want hair and makeup. And then two weeks before their wedding, they're like, oh, you know what? Only five want to get done now. Well, then you still owe for the other five, or you can have someone else replace them. So right. we still need to come out for the 10 that were initially contracted. Sure. Makes sense. I mean, every other business would work that way. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, so that's something else we do as well. So, Ms. Ariella, are there any other non-negotiables um, in your contracts? Definitely. So one thing, this is probably my biggest, biggest one because I've come across this so many times, is making sure the client is providing the proper workspace. So what I mean by that is making sure that the girls aren't working in a bathroom all crammed up with not enough work or working in a small little home that doesn't have air conditioning or heat on. So basically having the proper work condition. How do you Um, word that? I mean, how do you word that in the contract? I mean, that, that, that... I don't even. I wouldn't even know how to begin the sentence, but is, I suck at sentences. Is anyway. it at your discretion? No, definitely not at their discretion. If I left it to their discretion, I'd never get what I was asking for. <laughs> right. Um, but as far as the workspace, it would be basically the artist and stylist needs a designated space and location, and that the client would be responsible for preparing. Preparing meaning making sure that there's enough chairs and outlets and mirrors and things that we can work properly. So just making sure that they have the proper space to work. So if we show up and they're, you know, we're working in a home where it's 90 degrees because someone's air condition is broken, we have the right to refuse their event and they would still owe compensation in full. Um, and wow. the reason I did this is because I felt like people were basically compromising their workspace because they didn't want to perhaps invest in a bridal suite or something that was bigger so all the girls can get ready and comfortably. Right. And instead, we were all crammed up in like a standard room with a bed full of like 10 girls plus the photographer and videographer, mm-hmm. not to mention two artists and two stylists. Um, so how does that like- work? So like if I'm a bride, how does that work? Like, you know, if I hire a venue, I can't really control, you know, what what that 
what the environment's like. So how, uh, I, I guess I don't know how I would get over that um, being a bride. Yeah, definitely. So a couple things. So if you want to get ready at the actual wedding venue, oftentimes they have bridal suites. And for the most part, they're a decent size. If it's not a decent size, because, you know, if someone has a large bridal party, mm -hmm. then I recommend that we either get ready at someone's home or a local hotel that maybe right. where their guests are staying or things of that such. So that's a really, really important one. And that goes back to just boundaries and being able to be comfortable to tell people, you know, this is not this is not working. The space is too tight or it's really warm in here. Or can you turn the air down or things like that? People that things that I feel like people get very uncomfortable, you know, when asking. I admire the heck out of you. I mean, these are these are conversations that are incredibly difficult to have. And, you know, just to have the. Uh, cojones to even <laughs> to be able to um to have those conversations bravo and bravo for putting it in your contract are Thank there any you. other non-negotiables yeah this is super super important i have a replacement policy so if i have a makeup artist working and or a hairstylist and there are you know young girls running around flower girls junior bridesmaids and they want to you know grab uh eyeshadow palette or makeup brushes or brushes or anything like that if anything is compromised, there is a replacement policy. So the bride would be responsible for replacing any damages that are done to our products and or equipment. Wow, that's another great one. Wish we had that in the salon. Yeah, yeah those are huge. <laughs> you know? Super, super big. You know, we all invest so much in our equipment and our products that, you know, to have them ruined just like that should definitely you know, come with some type of policy. That's a big one. I remember being in a salon and, uh, a client literally took a pair of shears and started cutting paper with it, you know. And, Stop. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's true. You know, the hairdresser walked away for a sec or, you know, was blow drying or something. They just picked the scissors up and started cutting paper. Is that when you like, you know, I'm just coloring hair now. I'm not cutting no more. <laughs> I ain't cutting no more. Um, yeah, I just, I couldn't, it, everybody, you know, every, you know, like when uh, you're working in a, in a salon and a pair of shears drop and the entire place goes quiet and everyone takes a big gasp of air. Yeah. You know, clients just, terrifying. they have they don't understand on any level that a pair of shears is easily a thousand bucks or yeah, can be, you they know, have no idea. or even just any, you know, equipment products that you sure. use. That. Absolutely. That's crazy, man. We need that policy. I'm going to have that policy. I'll make all my clients sign it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no doing arts and crafts in my chair. Have it on my window <laughs> uh, mirror. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good call. <laughs> wow. That, that's a great one, man. That, that's one I wouldn't even think. Well, I guess, I guess you learned the hard way is why you thought of that one, huh? And that's Exactly right. So everything that is in my contract is based off of experience and my contract is not set in stone. So it's something that I definitely evaluate every season and see kind of like what things had happened, what I feel like needs to be added. Um, there's, I'm always adding to it because there's just things that come up. There's things that I don't expect or, you know, sure. So I'm definitely always updating it. It's never set in stone and who knows? Maybe my contract will turn into like six or seven pages one day. But right now we're at four, <laughs> so I think we're good. Do you uh, help uh, your coaching clients uh, come up with these contracts as well, or do you uh, allow them to uh, cut and paste it? Yeah. Yeah. So definitely no cutting and pasting, and I do this for many reasons. One, because they're hiring me for a period of time. So unless I'm going to be with them holding their hand throughout the duration of their entire business, it's important for them to learn how to do these things on their own. So with me working with them, it's really prepping them to know how to take care of all the priorities by themselves. What I'm there doing is I'm there looking over their contract. I'm advising them what they should be adding to their contract that I feel like is missing. So what I'm not doing is I'm not handing over my contract and basically looking over theirs. If they don't have one, I ask them to create one and a few bullet points of what should be included. Um, and it's important for me to see their verbiage and how they're writing it out uh -huh. because if they're not doing it, I guess, in a correct or professional manner, I need to fix that so they know how to do it for the future. When you say correct or professional, do, are you talking about, like, legally professional? Because I mean, well, it's a legal document. Well, it's legal. Yeah. Um, but the verbiage initially in a contract could just be things, you know, policies or procedures that they feel like is important to them and they don't want to compromise on. After they've written it out, after I've reviewed it, then I ask them to take them, you know, take it to a lawyer. What a lawyer is going to do is basically give the proper legal verbiage that mm -hmm. I, of course, can't do because I'm not a lawyer. Right. But it's definitely important to have your contracts set in legal terms so it can, you know, hold up in a state court. And every and jurisdiction's a little different as well. 
That's exactly right. So they need to, of course, confide with their state lawyer and see what would work in their state court. So having it legal is so important. Um, it's not something that I had from the beginning. I didn't have a lawyer look at my contract six years ago because mm -hmm. I didn't even know that I had to do that. Um, and then I put myself in a really sticky situation where I felt like having to court might, you know, or going to court might have to be an option for me when I was dealing with a particular situation. And then I got to a point where I was like, I got to do something about this. Right. And then I, I seeked out for a lawyer. But it's so incredibly important at this point. Absolutely. Well, you know, any business you have, you, you need some kind of con or you're going to sign some kind of contract. So if you're going to start your business, you need to be the um, the, the leader in the contract. Hundred percent, absolutely. Yeah. No. I'm, so when people want to hire you or bring you on, do you go like, for instance, if you know you do individual coaching, but do you do salon coaching as well? Can a sal salon reach out to you? Yeah. So I don't. I have not done any salon coaching. I don't know if I super foresee that. I feel like it's mainly just like an online business. It's something that I could do calls with, video calls with. I almost feel like stepping into a salon and talking to other stylists about running a business is almost conflicting to a salon owner, which is why I would not do that. What I have done is I have talked to salon owners that want to kind of upscale their, their bridal side of business. Right. So I have spoken with salon owners that are like, I don't know what to add into my contract. I don't know how to focus on bridal and, you know, still be behind the chair. So I have talked to a couple of people that just don't know how to create a balance for both or don't really want to close their salon on a Saturday to go on site for a wedding because from a financial standpoint, it sure. doesn't make sense to them. It really just depends on everyone's situation because if they have like, you know, 20 chairs and they can leave 10 stylists behind to do, you know, regular cuts and colors and send the other half of the salon to do on site weddings, then that makes sense. So it just sure. depends on everyone's situation and what they're dealing with. Ariella, man. You are with it. Dude, I am, <laughs> I am blown away. You know, this is, this is great information. I'm literally sitting here aghast by the information that you're sharing and, and, and just the balls to kind of do it. Um, congratulations. Yeah, the generosity that you've given our listeners. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Thank sure. you. This is exactly what I wanted. I wanted people to realize that running a business is, is more than just being creative. Being creative is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But you can't run a business with just that. You need to have other skills under your belt. Well, that's not a business. That's being creative. Yeah, right. so how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, totally. So they can find me at successu.biz where they can go ahead and fill out the questionnaire to start a 30-minute call. Um, or they can even just go on the website and check out all the free content I have. So I have a library of free resources that talks anywhere about how to run a business like a business, mm -hmm. talking a little bit about what to do during your off-season. Um, so there's, there's general things that could, people could be doing to get their name out there or to really just revamp their business during their slower months when they have more time. So even whether or not they're ready to hire a coach or ready to talk to somebody, I think it, they should still head on over to the website and just check out the free content, just all the value that I was able to bring. Um, just look it over. Yeah, I was looking at it and, uh, even though they're not even hiring you, you're giving away so much information, so much free information. I mean, that's, again, the generosity is incredible. But, uh, yeah, for our listeners, if, uh, if you know, even if you're not ready, like she said, definitely go there. And, I mean, there's so much available that you're giving out. Yeah, there's definitely a ton um, between blog posts and a library of free resources that I'm constantly updating um, definitely check it out. I'm Instagram is definitely the ha you know the place where I'm hanging out. That's success you at uh, Instagram, and that's double underscore. So success double underscore you. Uh -huh. And uh, there's a ton of stuff on there too. Even if someone just wants to scroll and find a bunch of things, there's always there too. Um, I'm probably going to start doing a little bit more live Q and A's where people kind of like just throw out a couple questions, scenarios, and I'm able to answer them right on the spot. I love doing things like that. Um, there's definitely a lot of things in the works. I'm considering a couple of webinars, a couple like mini courses for people. So it really just depends where I feel like, you know, what's necessary, what people are really yearning for. Right, right. Um, so when you do those uh, live Q&As, are you doing that like Instagram live? Um, yeah, so I've done Instagram live and I've done Facebook live. So Facebook, I have a private group where I have people, you know, just kind of hanging out as a community. Wait a sec. How am I not on that group, Ariella? I know. I got to get you in there. So, yeah, Tony and I would definitely jump in there. <laughs> so we have a 
have a uh, Success You Facebook page, which is not super active because it's linked to my Instagram and it's basically the same stuff. Mm -hmm. But then if you have, there's a group also Success You where you just have to be approved. So you hit on over there and there's a ton of stuff there too. I do a lot of polls in there. I did some Q and A's in there. What's nice about the, the Facebook lives is it is actually there to stay. As oh, opposed right. to Instagram, where it only stays for 24 hours. Okay. But can't you, you can save them though, right? Can't you save them on like your highlights or something? You know what? I could. I haven't gotten into that yet. I'm really curious how that works. So I, I, want, I need to get more into that. That's, oh, I gave you something. You awesome. did. I, I, <laughs> I love it. I, I'm obsessed with Instagram. It's definitely where I'm probably hanging out the most. Yeah, we definitely live there the most. As a matter of fact, we're managing this whole thing through Instagram, um, at least for now. Have you uh, have you checked out Vero at all? What is it? Have you checked out Vero at all? I haven't. What is that? Vero, is, you better get on that. So Vero is a new social media um, platform. Um, it's re- it really, really took off the first week of March, um, believe it or not. And uh, in the first week of March, I think that's when they eclipsed a million um, people? Followers. Followers, or, or just a million or people. Downloads. On downloads, a million downloads. Uh, so what Vero initially uh, said was that the first million um, followers or downloads that they get, they were going to be on there for free. And then if you were after the million that you'd have to pay. But they've actually opened that up a little bit. So it's a social media um, platform where they're guaranteeing or they're promising that there's not going to be any adverts and there's not going to be any algorithms and there's not going to be any of that. You know, you just go in there and you post. Um, but, you know, at some point they're going to start charging uh, people to be on there. So they'll get their money from the actual users, but it'll open okay. it up. It'll be huh. free of algorithms and stuff. However, like I said, get on there now if you can, because they haven't started charging yet. They opened it up past a million um, because they had such an influx a couple of weeks ago. Now, to be honest, the app's a little wonky at this point, but um, every day it gets a little bit smoother and a little bit cleaner. But I highly advise um, that you at least check it out. You know, at least open an account, even if you don't do anything with it, just so you're in on the uh, the free bits. Yeah, absolutely. That's great to know. Thank you, guys. I had no idea about it. I don't feel too behind if they just started in March. <laughs> well, no, no, they started a while ago. They just, just something happened the first... What what did Ma- what does Malcolm Gladwell say? The tipping point, right? They hit their tipping point at the beginning of March and just it, it just blew up, blew up, blew up. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, definitely do that. For yep. sure. Cool. Well, Miss Ariella, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. I think you've given and given and given, and I just wanted uh, you know just say thank you, and uh, r- we really appreciate yeah. uh, you giving to our listeners. Yeah, thanks for giving back and uh, really taking care of our industry. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. It's been so much fun. And I just love being able to provide all this powerful information. I hope, you know, your listeners got some use out of it and they can start implementing a few things. So thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Miss Ariella, thank you for joining us on your day off.